Okay, everybody, welcome to my live stream with Eric Johnson, who basically invented and pioneered the strategy of mold avoidance to heal from chronic fatigue syndrome. And in fact, he was the guy who basically, how would you say it, Eric? You use the words mold at ground zero for CFS. How would you explain? Well, I was the first prototype for the Holmes 1988 chronic fatigue syndrome. And I started this syndrome thinking that people, researchers would want to know about the syndrome. And the first words spoken over the inauguration of this new syndrome would be important. So I explained to researchers, chronic fatigue syndrome researchers, I have an inexorably increasing reactivity to mold that grows progressively worse no matter where I live or how well I try to take care of myself. And I suggested that they look into mold before there are millions of people like me. And so the researchers, they were interested at first, but then they quickly moved on, right? Yeah, um, they couldn't find any reason for mold to affect, to have acted up, to emerged in so many places at, at the same time. So they said, it can't be mold, it has to be a virus. It has to be something else unleashing the reactivity to the mold. Hmm. So, You've been doing mold avoidance for 30 years. How long? I mean, and I'm going to, I bring this up for a reason. How, how long would you say? Well, actually, the first time I undertook a deliberate strategy of mold avoidance, that is trying to get out of a moldy building and stay away from it as much as possible, was um, 1964. 1964. Yeah. So I, I probably remember this story. It was something like you were on a family vacation in Strawberry and you noticed that if you went outside, something like that, right? Well, kind of. Um, my parents were running an old hotel, an old stagecoach stop on the uh, Sonora Bridgeport Toll Road on Sonora Pass, a place called uh, Old Strawberry, the Old Strawberry Hotel. And this building was so old, it was before insulation was invented. It had been insulated by stuffing newspapers into the wall. And we cut into the back wall to uh, install a walk-in refrigerator for the kitchen area. We needed a little more refrigeration space. And when we cut through that wall, all these black moldy newspapers spilled out. And we thought, wow, these are historic, so they probably have some value. Let's open them up and see if we can read them. We couldn't. They were totally covered with mold. But at that moment, I just dropped in my tracks, crawled to, to bed, couldn't move for a couple of days and realized, so that's what's been making me so sick. And just for viewers, just so you guys know, I'm not looking down distracted. I'm actually looking down at my settings for this live, trying to share it and record it and make sure everything's set up okay. Um, what you guys may re might not realize is that I re remember almost everything that Eric has ever said. It's like, I don't have a photographic memory, but I remember almost everything that Eric has said. And that tends to happen when somebody has a great impact on your life and your recovery. You know, you, you ruminate on these thoughts and, and on what he said. I mean, I literally have pretty much every aspect of your story, your books, uh, quotes that you've sent me in direct messages, just like in my brain. Um, so. What, what would you say your, your main motivation is now in the mold community sticking around? I mean, you're very generous to share your time and your insights. You don't need to do that. So why, what's your motivation? Why are you helping people? Why are you still here? Well, because through a very strange set of circumstances, I wound up becoming the first prototype for Holmes 1988 chronic fatigue syndrome. I was in Incline Village. I watched the flu-like illness move in. I watched people get sick. I watched them go from doctor to doctor trying to figure out anything they could do to get better. And because of my prior experience with mold, I realized that all the clusters, all the groupings of the sick people with the mystery illness were in moldy buildings, the very same ones that had been affecting me. 
So I, that's when I contacted the uh, researchers, like Dr. Paul Cheney, and said, maybe this mold is more than a cofactor. Maybe it's not just a random secondary part of the process. The clusters indicate that if you hadn't been exposed to mold at the same time as you got that weird flu, you probably have a normal recovery. So that elevates it in importance to being equal with the virus. Hmm. So my I, motivation I, was to make sure they knew about this and looked into it. I, I remember your story of having sort of been mold sick, but being stable. And then you picked up a piece of firewood or wood in the, in the forest that had a strange looking mold on it. Maybe it was like beige with a green tip which then later we, spe we, we speculate maybe it was this penetrame mold, I don't really know. And then you went, you got even sicker after that event. That was like an event in the timeline and you went, and you went into a deeper sickness. Yeah, I was getting sicker and sicker inside a building, not being able to quite figure out what was going on. I got a camper which had no water system and felt better than the house. So I spent more and more time out in the camper and it seemed like this was going to get me out of this mess. And then I was out getting firewood with, with my brother, picked up a moldy log, got a face full of this horrible mold and just dropped in my tracks. And that seems to have been my threshold moment that put me over the edge where my mold exposure became so much that from that point on, I couldn't really recover from it anymore. I just spiraled down a black hole. So I think that's so interesting, um, given the sickness that's going around the world today. I don't really want to name it because probably we'll get banned, but everybody knows what I'm talking about, the sickness, right? Because a lot of us who, who are practicing what I call Eric-style mold avoidance, because Eric invented it, have noticed that there's like this intimate relationship between this particular sickness and mold. Like when we get the sickness, our mold reactivity goes up. And it's almost like the body saying like, hey, you better, get, you better get even more clear of mold now because you have this specific sickness. So it's like there's this direct relationship. If you get the sickness, you have to be more clear of mold. And a lot of people would say, I once had a Lyme disease um, patient tell me, they said, I, I don't like doing mold avoidance. It makes me more sensitive, reactive. I don't like doing ozone. It makes me more reactive. And I said, maybe that's your body actually telling you that you need to be further away and more reactive like it's it's not bad to be reactive to a polar bear that's trying to eat you like that's a good thing that's your body saying like go away right so i mean you must have seen this you know there, so there was actually a china flu in the 80s right and it was a very specific like bad virus it wasn't just like oh another cold like it was it was specific right yeah it was kind of like the hong kong flu or a super mild version of the 1918 spanish flu but the chronic fatigue syndrome the entity, the public awareness of this specific type of illness happened after a marathon runner who had been traveling in China came to Incline Village and within a week or two, hundreds of people lit up in town with this same type of illness. That's when Dr. Cheney and Dr. Peterson called the CDC for help, thinking they've got an epidemic on their hands. It's, it's funny because Eric and I are from the same hometown, Lake Tahoe, different parts of the lake, but I actually traveled in a lot of the same circles that Eric did. And we just found this out recently talking about certain doctors in Reno, all of these guys that I went to see and none of them could figure out the core problem. Um, I remember even good, well-intentioned doctors. There was one doctor in particular, Dr. Michael Gerber, who I really liked. He was very helpful, very nice guy. Nothing, nothing but good to say about him. But it was like, he sent me out the door with a list of like a hundred supplements and, uh, you know, it, it was just unmanageable. Um, and again, I no hard feelings to him. I know he was just trying to help me. And, and I think he was a great guy. He later on in my sickness, he helped me again. And I was kind of um, depressed. I, rem I remember this very specifically. I first went to see him in 2002. And then I went back again to see him in 2017. And I thought to myself, this is so depressing. I've been to this guy twice in 15 years and I'm still no further along. In fact, I'm even worse. And it was like, that was kind of when I had the realization that 
it's it's like Eric said. It, by, by the way, guys, if you're listening to this, you'll see that I quote Eric like in every other sentence because I have a lot of his statements memorized because they were life changing, you know. But when Eric said it's like a, a train speeding down the tracks on the side of a mountain and everybody can see where the train's going to end up at the bottom in a giant train wreck if you don't change the trajectory. Um, but it's very easy when you're on the train going down the hill to sort of um, not really realize what's going to happen. <laughs> like you're, you don't really realize like that. That's the way a lot of Lyme and CFS patients are right now around the world. Right. They're like, Oh, it'll be okay. You know, one day uh, things will get better. Maybe it won't get better. It didn't for me. And so I went back to see this guy, you know, 15 years apart and it wasn't better. I wasn't better. I was worse and I was getting worse. Should I uh, tell the story about Dr. Gerber, my interaction with him? Yeah. I mean, definitely. I think we just, you know, have to be okay. careful. I think we have to be careful on live stream what we say about people. So keep, keep it positive. But. Okay. Yeah. I won't say anything, you know, really horrible and I'll explain his reasoning and mine. In 2002 um, summer, I went down to tell Dr. Gerber about mold at ground zero for chronic fatigue syndrome and Dr. Shoemaker's recently published book, Desperation Medicine. Cause Dr. Shoemaker was the first person who seemed to put it together that the chronic fatigue syndrome, the original incline village incident was biotoxin related. So I got all excited and I was taking this to all kinds of CFS clinics and Dr. Gerber advertised himself as being a chronic fatigue syndrome clinic. And he had seen Peterson patients, other members of the original cohort. So I thought this would be a great opportunity for uh, Dr. Gerber to put all the pieces together, make it, perhaps make himself a name as the premier CFS specialist for connecting this before anybody else does. And lo and behold, I walk into his office and find out that he's in a sick building. Hmm. You know, my perceptions told me immediately that something was wrong. And Dr. Gerber really knew nothing about toxic mold at all. In fact, his entire staff was sick and he couldn't figure out why. So he had me use my senses to perceptify his office. We went through all the rooms and he led me to one storage room. And I said, oh yeah, the worst of it's in here. And he goes, ah, that's what I thought. See, that was his wife's office. And she had gotten so ill that she couldn't stand to be in that room anymore. So he got her out of there, turned it into a storage room and told his staff only to be in there as short a time as possible to get things and then keep the door closed. So mm. while I'm telling this to Dr. Gerber, members of his staff are coming up to me going, oh, I've got these blinding headaches and nothing is helping. And one of them is going, I've checked my EBV titers, Epstein-Barr virus titers, and they keep going up and up and up. And I'm afraid that if I can't do something about this, I'm going to wind up with full blown chronic fatigue syndrome. I said, well, fortunately, you're in luck because we find that these titers are mediated by mold exposure and by getting out of here, you'll reduce your risk and probably everything will be fine. And Dr. Gerber actually did move his office out of that building. So he sent me uh, patients for about a year after that from 2002 to 2003. And we talked about the difficulties of mold avoidance and how savage it is in that if it's a really toxic mold like stachybotrys, you might have to abandon all your possessions. Well, his mm. patients didn't want to hear that and they got angry. And after a year, Dr. Gerber told me straight out that he can't bring it up with his patients because it makes them, it makes them so angry to discuss this possibility of having to bail out and leave everything that they were talking bad about him, saying that he's a poor doctor, that his supplements aren't helping, and that he can't do anything. So, you know, they were just talking trash about him. And he goes, it's, it's not worth it. I mean, they don't want to know about it. It only makes them angry. So if somebody wanted to discuss it openly, I think he would, but he's not going to really bring it up unless you do first, because patients flat out don't want to hear it. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's really interesting that you say patients don't want to hear it because I was one of those patients and I, I there was a website mm, 
year 2000, 2002 that had similar information. Um, it was, it, I think it was called Wellspring. Does that ring a bell? No. Okay. Well, there was a website that was showing people that were doing mold extreme mold avoidance and I did not want to hear it. Why do you think that patients don't want to hear it? Well, it's uh, brutal. I mean, the prospect of losing everything you own, everything you've worked for, uprooting your life, becoming a refugee from mold, <laughs> who, who would do that if they could possibly avoid it by taking some supplement or buying air filters, any, any remediation? If you could get out of it by any other way, of course, that would be preferable. Right. And that's the way that our medical system is set up is it's set up for there to be a consumer and a vendor and the consumer is buying supplements or services from the vendor who's either a doctor selling IVs or supplements or acupuncture. And that's the way we're indoctrinated as sick people that we should be a consumer and go find something to consume. And we walk out of that office. I remember, I mean, I, I've spent, and I'm not trying to claim a prize or anything, but I've spent over a million dollars of my own money on, um, and my parents' money on different treatments. And probably everybody else has either. I don't claim a prize for this. And you walk out of the office that day and you got your bag of supplements and you got your receipt and you feel good. You feel like I did something. I'm moving in the right direction. But as it turns out, feelings don't help you out very much at the end of the day, just because you feel good, like you did something good for yourself, doesn't really mean that that system of being a consumer and consuming, you know, medical products, that doesn't mean that that's going to solve your problems. Yeah, it's important that doctors learn about this toxic mold phenomenon, so they can tell the difference between somebody who has the potential to recover by doing remediation and supplements, and those who have to adopt a mold avoidance lifestyle. Yeah, er, another Eric quote that I'll I, like you. You guys will base, basically just hear me quoting Eric all day long. Um, but he used the analogy of the event horizon, which I happen to understand very well because I'm a science nut and I'm especially an astronomy nut. And I try to sh force astronomy down my kids' throats all the time. And they're like, "Dad, that's for dorks." I'm like, "No, it's really cool." But the event horizon in a black hole is where a black hole is so strong that it can suck everything into itself. It can suck even light into itself. And that's why it's black because it's sucking light into itself. And if you get close enough to the black hole, it'll suck you in and you'll never see out again because it's literally sucking the light back in. So the event horizon in terms of mold avoidance is if you get past a certain point of no return um, where you've had too much mold exposure, then everything changes in your journey and your story. You're no longer able to just do simple, mild remediation or take supplements. Now, all of a sudden you've like flipped a switch. Uh, Lisa Pet Petrison once explained it as like a circuit breaker being blown in your body, which I love that analogy. That's like a, an event, it's a very specific thing that happens. Like boom, a circuit breaker is blown and now something's different. You can't just go back to the days of um, how it was before, right? Exactly. And if you look for examples of people in sick buildings where they hit this event horizon, it's all around us. It's plain to see. I mean, it is so obvious to anybody who's been through it that we can't understand why doctors have such a difficult time seeing it. Hmm. Now, in the original chronic fatigue syndrome cluster, and I'm talking about the very first one, Truckee High School, where a bunch of teachers got sick in a single room. This was widely publicized. Millions of people have read about it. This was the absolute incident that caused Dr. Cheney and Dr. Peterson to call the CDC for help because nine out of 10 teachers got sick in a single room. How bizarre is that? Not the people in the library next door, not the people in the Dean's office, not the other teachers who didn't go into that room, the teachers who went in that room consistently acquired the mystery malady, which the CDC called chronic fatigue syndrome, and other people just a few feet away did not. Mm. So what was it in that room? You, you know what, Eric? I, I think your, your discoveries are so far ahead of their time. Uh, I've always said that a lot of Nobel Prize winners discover what they discovered long before the world gives them a Nobel Prize, right? Like, it could be it can be decades later. It could be after they die before the world realizes what 
they discovered. And I have an interesting story that's just like that. Um, so Eric talks about how only the people in a certain room got the malady, even though these teachers were with kids all day and going to staff meetings and in cafeterias, like there's no way they weren't exposed to the same stuff, right? There had to be something special about this room. I just experienced that. Um, my wife and kids, now that we're kind of back over the hump of extreme mold avoidance, uh, my wife and kids are trying to find activities in churches and youth groups and everything's fine. Everything's hunky dory. They, they go to, you know, my daughter does dance. My um, other daughter does gymnastics. My son goes to youth group. Everything's fine. You know, and then once in a while they'll get a cold, they'll get a bug. Well, this one time a couple weeks ago, they went to a church and it was horribly moldy. I could feel the mold from um, 50 feet away from this building. And I told my wife, I said, you can go in there. I mean, we'll just decontaminate whatever. But when they came out, they had an illness that was bad. It was almost, it almost felt like it was a mixture of mold and some kind of virus or something that had like gotten together because I reacted to them like crazy. I never react to them when they go in buildings. They just shower, move on. Never, ever, ever. And it was like exactly what you're talking about. Like there was something about that building, that location that, that did the deed that made things worse. And it's not like you could say, oh, well, you know, Brian, it's just because your family was quarantining before and they just were around people for the first time. No, 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 no. They, they've been, you know, freely moving about town and everything for months. This was something special about that building that was bad. Yeah, and in the original cluster, uh, it's nine out of 10 teachers. Well, what about that other teacher? What about that 10th teacher? He realized the room was making him sick, so he went out and spent his all of his spare time in his camper, either mm -hmm. out in the parking lot or driving away from the school area, because that felt even better than sitting out in the parking lot. So here we have a direct example of what the disease process is, who crosses the event horizon, and who managed to realize they were getting sucked into a black hole and got out just in time. Mm. Yeah, and that was intuitive. That was perceptifying. This guy just somehow knew that going out in his camper was better. Sure. Well, you know, that was my high school. And so prior to the flu going through, I argued with those very teachers. And I told them, there's something about this room and this zone, the front of the school, the entrance that's making us sick. And it feels better to spend more time away from it. And it was amazing. There were a lot of people who intuitively decided to stay out of that area. But there's sort of a mindset among a certain, maybe it's the academic mental block that thinking they know better than anybody else, because they said to me, well, my doctor says there's nothing here, so I'm going to trust my doctor, which was a very bad move. Yeah, it's like, you know, we all love science and double blind placebo controlled studies and nobody, nobody in their right mind is going to say that's a bad thing, but that doesn't mean you can't avoid danger uh, before science catches up. I mean, I always use the analogy of, you know, 5,000 years ago, I'm sure there were cavemen who uh, avoided poisonous snakes. And they were like, I saw my friend get bit by that snake with the red spots and he fell to the ground and died. And so I'm going to avoid that snake. And there's probably another caveman that says, well, you shouldn't avoid that snake. There's no double blind placebo controlled studies that say that it, you know, it's bad. Well, I, like I said, I just saw my friend get bit by the snake and he fell over and died. So I'm going to avoid the snake. Right. So that there are these people that are so dogmatic, so pedantic in their thinking that they literally will get run over by a semi. If there's no placebo controlled studies that say that a semi can kill you. It's like, really? That's not human common sense. Humans have been avoiding dangerous things for thousands, millions of years, whatever, however long we've been around. That's, that's okay with me to avoid dangerous things, even if you don't have all the answers yet. In fact, I mean, I use this example in one of my podcasts before, um, you know, the, 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 the sailors that got scurvy and they, you know, had vitamin C deficiencies on their long journeys. Um, when they figured out that sucking on limes, as the famous story goes, they didn't know it was vitamin C that was helping them, but they still sucked on the limes. <laughs> like they, they still did the right thing. Yeah, if it works, it's well worth doing. And I think that's the biggest difference between Eric and I is he's very interested in the science, whereas I'm just interested in getting away from the mold. <laughs> like, I mean, I was so sick with this disease. It absolutely 
horrific scene of my life in you know late 2016 2017 it, it's it's funny to me people are like so brian when you decided to do mold avoidance what did you think about this or what did you think about that and i'm like i don't think you get it i was like a like an animal fighting for its life literally just scrambling for its life i wasn't thinking i wasn't analyzing i wasn't saying oh should i do an rv or should i do a tent it wasn't like that for me i was um at the very end i spent just so you guys know i don't share this a lot because it's kind of vulnerable but i spent and and i never had the chronic fatigue you know post exertional mount that was not my symptom my symptoms were all uh brain dysfunction and i spent all of 24 hours of a day either wailing and moaning and crying in bed or fighting off you know i don't know if i can say the word on the air but you know unaliving myself thoughts for half of the day it was either crying being in the emergency room or fighting off those kinds of thoughts and so mold avoidance for me was a very visceral activity a very visceral experience it was a um a a hope a prayer of of somehow being able to raise my kids and every time i thought about unaliving myself um i would just my kids would just flash before my eyes and i would say i can't do that to them i mean what are they going to say for the rest of their lives that you know and so that's why my particular slant on mold avoidance is the practical slant it's not because i'm it's not because I chose that or one day I thought, hmm, should I be interested in the scientific side of this or the practical side of it? It's because my story was the practical side of it. Well, I'm concerned with the science because it's fascinating to me watching the development of how the scientific mind grapples with this problem and what is known about it and what isn't known and what creates confusion and you know, all that stuff is it's a lot of fun. It's quite a hobby of mine. But there's something even more important here, and that is how can our entire medical profession miss something so glaringly obvious in plain sight? It's like the medical system, the medical mindset is broken. And if they can do this to something like the sick building syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome phenomenon, what else are they screwing up? Hmm. I mean, we can just about predict that if uh, PFOS or glyphosate, or some, you know, uh, the um, microparticles from plastics result in some kind of unknown illness, we can predict that they will react in the same way with total suppression. Hmm. Yeah, it really is like there's these established um, deviations from truth in the medical field that just never get better. And, and they just are it, it's like a, a vicious cycle. You know, people go to medical school, they feel all proud, they start making a lot of money, they get the accolades and the achievement, and then they all of a sudden think that they're infallible and there's no humility. I actually lost a friend recently. I was in like a men's accountability Christian group, and one of the guys was a physician's assistant that I've known a long time, and he started going at me about this and, you know, saying, and, and I just, I, I couldn't do it. I was like, you know, I've, I've got, I don't have enough time in my life to have people like you in my life. I didn't say that to his face, but I just kind of stopped calling him back. Cause I was like, this isn't, you know, um, so I, I mean, I don't know what to do about that, that, you know, I don't know. <laughs> well, if you look at Lyme disease or the H pylori ulcer debacle where uh, Barry Marshall had to prove to the world that a bacteria is responsible for ulcers and not stress, and how Lyme disease was discovered in the mid-1970s, and yet the medical profession still remains unaware of it. How is it possible in this age of modern communication that it takes so long for vital information to permeate through the medical population? This isn't right. I, I can totally understand your frustration. I mean, you've been you've known about this and been pursuing this for it sounds like 40 plus years and i mean there's got to be a tremendous amount of frustration that builds up um i i would say the biggest reason for me wanting to quit doing any of this work i don't make money in any of this by the way you guys um and so i think that you know makes me a little bit more of an unbiased voice 
Um, I tried to sell a book on mold avoidance and it sold 19 copies. So that was a failure to make money. But um, it's my biggest frustration in this, in doing this is exactly what you just said, that nobody listens. Well, if patients don't stand up for themselves and get the medical profession to behave reasonably, uh, look at all the challenges that are coming toward us in the future. We need a medical profession that responds in a, a much better fashion than they've been doing. So I think uh, it's everybody's duty to start asking them why they fail so badly, why they're not cooperating, and why we can't get good information out there in a, in a timely fashion. Yeah, this, you know, it, I think it might take, it might require um, pe medical professionals getting sick themselves to, to really do this. I had this experience in um, my healthcare journalist career. I was a healthcare journalist. I sold, you know, 100,000 copies of a book that I wrote. And it, there was an electromagnetic machine that was helping a lot of us. Uh, it didn't, it was not a cure, obviously, because I went downhill quickly. But I would get calls from people who said, Brian, this machine, you know, help my wife, whatever, but they would never talk about it publicly because of the fear of the backlash. And they would also never talk about it publicly until they experienced for themselves the benefit. Um, but that was an easy treatment, right? You could just get this thing, set it on your desk and do it for 30 minutes. Whereas mold avoidance requires much more of like a life altering, uh, you know, experience. So people are never going to try it unless they get too sick. Yeah. Um, well, what I'm really focused on is how the scientific mind is supposed to work. Because doctors, they keep repeating over and over again, you have no proof, you have no evidence, there's nothing in the literature. Well, how did they ever discover anything with that kind of attitude? Uh, basically, a researcher looks into something because it doesn't make sense, not ignore it because it makes no sense. So their thinking is entirely backwards and they don't know what science is. It's circular reasoning because this isn't in the literature. Therefore, I can't look into it. It's like, well, wait, the whole reason you should look into it is because it's not in the literature yet. It's new. Have you ever thought there might be something new? It's crazy. The, one of the fascinating things about uh, the Holmes 1988 chronic fatigue syndrome definition is that if you read it carefully, Dr. Holmes' reasoning in having a whole long list of exclusions, and he, he said explicitly, rule out everything that could cause a similar condition, everything that's in the literature that you can test for, rule it out. And this will leave only something that is unknown. Because if you find any abnormalities in whatever is left over in this group, after you've already gotten rid of everything that you know about, if you find any, clue, any sign, look into that. So really, that's a very sensible and scientific way of looking at things. And yet when people talk about the chronic fatigue syndrome, they go, oh, that's just fatigue. That's just the name for all things fatigue. But if you read the definition, it's exactly the opposite. It's this exact ruling out process that is the avenue, the pathway to looking for a possibly unique and unknown medical entity. I've always wondered if my core problem was chronic fatigue syndrome and Lyme disease was just layered on top of that. And it was, it changed my immune system enough that I'd know, I didn't have the PEM. I've always kind of wondered that. Um, there was one time when I did, of course, a $20,000 crazy treatment in Italy that didn't work for anything. Um, but I, I was away from um, my moldy environment for long enough. I think it was like a sabbatical. I went to Italy for like a month to do this crazy treatment. And when I came back to Tahoe, to my moldy house, of course, I didn't know anything about mold avoidance. I didn't understand what was happening to me. I had like a week where I like was too tired to walk and I couldn't walk up the stairs. And I just felt this like bone tiredness. And, and, I, and, and But it went away. And then it got replaced with my Lyme disease symptoms. So I've kind of always wondered if Lyme disease is like a layer on top of chronic fatigue. I don't know. Well, during the 1985 outbreak, when Cheney and Peterson got a name for themselves and people were flying in from all over the country to see them, people started showing up who had a Western blot diagnosis of Lyme disease. And I was able to meet with these people, go around with them to the bad buildings. And I told Dr. Cheney and Dr. Peterson, these people with this Lyme disease are the only discrete 
known identified illness who are just as reactive to the sick buildings as people with the mystery illness. And I, that was such a strong correlation that I was just about ready at that point to go, that's it, chronic fatigue syndrome and Lyme disease must be the same thing. But that's not science because we had detected elevated viral titers and the epidemic outbreak moved through groups of people quickly like wildfire in a person to person easily transmissible manner. So it, it wasn't, I couldn't just leave it at that and go, okay, it's gotta be all the same because it looks the same. That's not the scientific process. It needs to be analyzed. Mm. And that is what has never been done. Yeah, I mean, at my sickest, I could still go hike up a hill for an hour and not have any consequences. Um, I didn't feel good and I felt like crap, but I didn't feel worse afterwards. I didn't get, I wasn't in bad. You know, I hear these stories of these chronic fatigue patients and if they do the dishes, you know, and exert themselves for 10 minutes, they literally can't, can't, they can't move for a month, you know, that nothing like that ever happened to me. And that's actually one of the most fascinating things about your discovery, Eric, to me, it goes back to your experience in the, in the moldy army barracks when you were in a moldy barracks and everybody got sick, but it presented differently and all of the different folks that were in there. And you were like, Hey, this is a, this is a common root cause because when I started mold avoidance um, and I was so f obsessed with Lyme disease, Lyme disease, Lyme disease, Lyme disease. And it was, it was true. I really did have Lyme disease. I really did have Bartonella. I really did have Babesia. I know I did. I got positive tests on all those things. I responded well to the herbs and the antibiotics that all the Lyme doctors said. But once I era erased that um, Lyme disease from my system, which was really easy. I mean, here I was spending, you know, 20 years trying to er erase it with a million dollars and none of it worked, but I just do mold avoidance and it goes away. Then all of a sudden I became more like you and more like all the other moldies out there. And so it, it was clear to me that Lyme disease is just a superficial layer. And it's so crazy to be saying that. I mean, we're sitting here on the cutting edge of medicine on this chat right now, and there's only 11 people listening. There should be 11,000. And I don't take one bit of credit for any of this. I'm, I'm simply following your footsteps. But to be able to say to my followers that Lyme disease is a superficial layer, that is like sacrilegious. That is like, um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for when you're heretical? That, that, I mean, to, there are Lyme disease doctors out there right now that would, they would explode, their brains would explode if they heard me saying this, that Lyme disease is just a superficial layer because they've dedicated their lives to antibiotic concoctions. And I, I, I did all this. There, there's a doctor out there, one of the, the most famous Lyme doctor on the East Coast. I'm not going to name him because I don't like, to, I don't want to get sued, but um, he wrote a book and it was like, how you get better from Lyme disease. And after, after all of us read the book, we were like scratching our head because there was, it was like a thousand things that he listed in the book, right? It was like, if you have this symptom or this lab, take this, this, and this. If you have this, and by the end time of the end the book, your head's just about to explode. You're like, you mean I have to do a thousand things? It, it was like, it, it was just crazy. It's like Occam's razor, right? If you have to do a thousand things to barely get 1% improvement, maybe you're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> like maybe, you know, like if your car's making a strange sound and you change the tires and change the steering wheel and repaint it and it still doesn't work dude you probably haven't found the problem <laughs> like you might yeah, not i didn't i didn't want to wind up like that i didn't want to act like i was so certain that i've got the answers that it actually blocks it frames the uh discussion so that it weeds out other answers other clues so it was important to me to get everybody together to just talk about these observations and see what we can figure out but uh, before we forget, I just want to mention that Dr. Cheney did all kinds of testing, uh, viral and immunological testing during the Lake Tahoe outbreak. And we saw people who were considered to be healthy controls suddenly acquire this post-exertion malaise phenomenon. And it was when they became seropositive for Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, or human herpes virus 6. Hmm but it didn't happen in other cities or every city. Well, we don't know because he wasn't testing anywhere else. He was testing this one small group. It was like a microcosm. So we, we could see what was going on. And there were people who had vague fatigue symptoms, but they could get better and they didn't match the parameters of the mystery illness. And then all of a sudden they, for all intents and purposes, 
became sick with a viral illness. And we know from Dr. Cheney's testing that previously they had had fluctuating EBV titers and it was when they became seropositive, when they moved into full-blown viral reactivation, that's when they acquired the post-exertion malaise. So your, your working hypothesis is that mold disables the immune system to some degree and allows whatever opportunistic infections happen to be around to pr proliferate. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that makes complete sense to me because why else would we all, all of us moldies end up with such different manifestations of it? You know, there, this, I mean, I live this every day. There's a guy on my group right now. I'm not going to name him because he hasn't given me permission, but he and I have been friends for 20 years, give or take. And we both lived in Tahoe and we both had, we both got chronically ill but our, our sicknesses were totally different, totally different, not, not even the same in the, in the slightest. And, you know, I was the Lyme disease guy and he, he didn't know, he didn't call it chronic fatigue syndrome. He had no idea what it was. He was still going to all the different doctors, but yet now we're both mold avoiders and we're both successfully reversing some of that symptomology. Um, and it's just amazing that there's this common cause that doctors aren't talking about. Well, the fascinating thing about the toxic mold, the trichothecine producing molds like Stachybotrys and Ketomium and Trichoderma, is they put out substances that are such immune disablers. They are so immune suppressive that they block protein synthesis. So essentially your regenerative mechanisms, the very processes by which your cells repair themselves is shut down. How can that not result in some kind of dysfunction at some point? Mm. I, yeah, I wonder why, like, you know, my sister or my dad um, don't aren't as sick as me and never got as sick. It's kind of a mystery because they have similar genetics, similar environments. Um, I do see subtle signs of mold poisoning in a lot of my family and friends, but it never seems to progress. And then, of course, there are friends that I know in Tahoe uh, that I know are in bad buildings that are fine. Uh, one of my friends who's 80 years old, who's one of my mentors and doing hard money loans and real estate and stuff. And the guy skis every day and whatever, he's got no symptoms at all. And his house feels bad to me. Well, if you look at the clusters, there's some good clues there because this threshold event, this black hole, the event horizon that we're talking about, you can see where people moved from a condition where they could get out of the building and recover to from that point on, they were in serious trouble no matter where they went. So, it was like you say, uh, a circuit breaker blew, a gear stripped, something happened in our defenses that after this event, this incident, the cytokine storm, some kind of permanent damage occurred and we are no longer capable of recovering just by moving away from the mold. I, yeah, I have, I know exactly when my event horizon occurred. And before that, I was able to stay high on the power curve, even though I didn't know what the power curve was, living in bad places in Tahoe. I mean, the funny thing now, I look back and it's kind of a tragedy because I had all of the things you talk about going on, but I just didn't know it. And I think about had I gotten out early, had I known early, it would have been easy to stay high on the power curve, right? We all know, we all think that, oh my gosh, if I had known but like, here's some of the things that I had early on, just so listeners can see how right Eric is. Like, so let me just preface this by saying, almost every time sick people go into an alternative medicine situation, they're let down. They try the supplement, it works for two days, then it stops working. They try the IV, it works. Through. So what I've noticed with listening to Eric is it's the opposite. The longer I listen to Eric, the more I think about what he said, the more correct it is. It's, it's not, it doesn't, I've been listening to Eric now for five years and it doesn't go backwards, it goes, it gets, but here's one example of that. And, and again, I quote Eric on this, but you know, hiking and increasing in elevation as a way to stay high on the power curve as a specific biological function where if you run on a mountain bike on a flat surface, it's not the same. I was absolutely addicted to hiking the mountains of Tahoe. And when I say addicted, I mean that if I didn't do a 3000 foot elevation hike every few days, I would become irritable and angry and yell at people and hate life. Like I, it was a, it was a physical addiction to hiking. And it, that's what Eric has always said that, you know, hiking uphill is a way to stay high in the power curve. Um, another 
example of something Eric said that was exactly correct for me was Eric said that there's something about recovering from this that leaves you aware of the toxins. It leaves you not necessarily made sick by them, but aware of them. And that's how I spent the first 25 years of my life. Everywhere I went in Tahoe, even before I got really sick, I could feel the bad stuff. I remember it right now. I remember where it was. I remember what streets it was on. I remember what it felt like. It didn't make me that sick because I was staying high in the power curve. But as soon as I crossed over that event horizon, I could no longer feel the bad stuff. I got masked. You know, I just became succumb to it. And hiking up hills no longer helped me. So there was something like that, that switch that made it from me being on the power curve to no longer being on the, the circuit got blown. And that was a bummer because if I had known even a little bit of this stuff, uh, it, it would have been easy. Yeah, Dr. Shoemaker uncovered a fascinating physiological explanation for that altitude gain effect. Um, we've got a lot of red cell damage. We've got a lot of platelet debris. Our blood is not working properly. And we're essentially running short on oxygen because the red cells are simply not, the erythrocytes aren't delivering it where it needs to go. And when you increase altitude, we have baroreceptors that tell the body, you're running out of oxygen, you need to compensate, produce more red cells. You know, that's what altitude sickness is all about and how people, they adapt to living at higher altitude, they produce more red cells. So moving up elevation in a transient quick manner forces the system to produce a pulse of the enzyme, erythropoietin, that dictates, tells the body to produce more red cells. So by continually pushing that system, hitting that button over and over again by increasing altitude, I was telling my body, produce more red cells. And that's in his books, and I'm surprised it didn't get more attention. Yeah, it, it's really amazing that you figured out so much of this stuff by yourself. You know, I keep thinking about how many decades it took you to piece all of this together. Like when I read your book, uh, Back from the Edge, which you guys, if you haven't read that book, you really need to read it. It's on Amazon. Just do a Google search for something like Back from the Edge, Eric Johnson, or Back from the Edge, Mold. And it's like a quick like 30 minute read that basically has Eric's story. And it's, it's really eye opening. Um, but when, when I read that, it, I, and I read and I look at the dates and I see 1980, 1990, 2000, I'm like, Oh my gosh, like you've been at this a long time trying to figure this stuff out. I mean, that that's amazing. Well, I wanted to have a life and this was the only way I could do it. Yeah, it, it's, it is, it is the only way. Uh, I wanted to talk about another quote that um, you have said, and I've always thought this is interesting, but I want to hear you explain it in your own words when you say, um, quote, or at least roughly quote, if you don't get clear enough, you'll stay like this forever. Yeah, during the 1980s, researchers were confused about this mold effect because initially it seemed like simply getting people out of a bad building was good enough. And then that wasn't the case anymore. And there was a hospital in Quebec City, Canada, that a bunch of medical professionals, professionals became ill. And they identified that it was a trichothecine producing mold, stachybotrys. So they made that correlation. And for the first time, they were able to follow the stories of these doctors and nurses and realize that about 10, 15% of them did not get better after they were removed from the building. So this completely overturned the, the concept of thinking of mold like an allergy that you get out and you, you get better automatically. There was something else going on here. So these people, they apparently had their gears stripped and they were like me. They couldn't recover just by trying to live a normal life. It required a little bit more, in my opinion. It, uh, they had to take extreme measures to do extreme mold avoidance or they wouldn't get clear enough to get that type of recovery that I experienced and others, others of us who do mold avoidance managed to achieve. So that's what I'm saying when I 
talk about people who don't get clear, just droning on and on and not getting better. They seem to be the subsets that are stuck in that situation and they need to put a little more attention into staying out of the bad places. Yeah, it's like this is really the core, I would say, of the practical aspect of what you discovered. It's that um, if you do the detox treatments, and trust me, I did them, whether you want to talk about saunas, detox IVs, I had a $15,000 home hyperbaric oxygen chamber, whatever. And even if you move into a new construction building and there's, it tests negative for mold, um, Eric says that for some people that's not enough and there's like a, a certain level of getting clear that is required to kind of get detox turned back on and you know we we say tent in the desert detox but that's just a metaphor it doesn't have to be a tent in the desert it, it is what it is whatever level or location it is but um what 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 did you feel when you got clear enough like what what got you to know there's something special about being more clear than just moving across the street into a different building. You know, when you were out camping at some of these locations, what, what tipped you off to know there was something special there or something special happening? Well, it was when I came back into contact with my truck, with my camper, with my contaminated possessions, I had a hyper intense reaction, an intensification response. And I became so acutely sensitive that I realized if I had felt this way, if I'd reacted this strongly when I had been back in the original exposure, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even have survived. How is it possible that out in the desert, now I can sense this so much that I can't even be near a single object from the place that made me sick. And yet when I was there, it didn't quite kill me. So that let me know that, know that this was something special. This was certainly no allergy. It was almost as if by getting clear and unmasking, I'd gone into a detox mode that any subsequent exposure was now putting me over tolerance. Hmm. I yeah, that, say, yeah. That, that was one of the interesting things I noticed during mold avoidance is previously in my Lyme disease journey, I was always making up progress and you know pretending that i was getting better i would take a supplement and i would feel some sensation right like something in my body and i go oh that must be important but it never was it never did anything long term it never really helped but then it was the opposite of doing mold avoidance i was skeptical of mold avoidance but there were these undeniable sensations that, that were happening and i was like wow i didn't take anything or eat anything like where's that coming from why am i feeling this so, and, and almost all of them were positive, you know, body improvements. And, and it was the opposite experience of going through all the Lyme disease treatments where I was so desperate for improvement that I would look for anything. That's why I, I laugh when people say, oh, it's the placebo effect. I'm like, buddy, I was the placebo effect for 20 years, begging desperately for any supplement to work and help and looking. Mold avoidance was the opposite. I was looking for the opposite placebo effect. I was looking for it to not work. <laughs> and then, you know, there was so many undeniable um, signs. And I, I have a document somewhere in one of my groups where I talk about all the things that were physically changing in my body. One of them was um, that I had had horrible chronic sinus infections for about five or six years when I was, at my, and I mean, these sinus infections were beyond, they, they would make me black out. I mean, just stuff that, you know, you couldn't even imagine. And I stopped having sinus infections when I started mold avoidance. And about a year into mold avoidance, I had this massive blob come out of my nose. And I was like, that's weird. And then I never had another sinus infection again. Um, you, you start to see real things happen when you do mold avoidance that you, that you didn't make up. That's, that was my experience. Absolutely. They say, well, you need to be positive. Adopt a mindset of healing in order to recover. Well, I'll tell you, people that <laughs> crawl out to the desert to try to save their lives are not in a positive frame of mind. You're about the worst situation you could ever be, thinking you're probably going to die. And then with no effort at trying to be positive about the situation, you recover anyway. That, 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 that's worth repeating to anybody listening. That's really worth repeating that with no hope and no expectation of a positive outcome, you recover anyway. 
what, who else can achieve that in, in alternative medicine? You know, I just continue to be amazed. That's the only reason I stay and do this is I just am amazed at what Eric discovered and how this all works. It's just amazing. It's, it's literally the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life that you can, um, and, and people, people have a false, you know, they think it's a miracle. Oh yeah, I'm just going to do multiple for a year and then I'm going to be able to go back and live however I want. That's not how it works. You still have this blown circuit that you have to deal with for the rest of your life. But it's the least of the evils as far as what I, what I know. Absolutely. This beats the hell out of being beat to hell. Yeah, I have a saying, you have to survive before you can thrive. There are literally sick people bedridden who are like, but, but, you know, but why are you doing, but what about this? What about this? I'm like, dude, you probably should be unbedridden before you give advice. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, what do you have to show for not doing mold avoidance, you, you bedridden person? What do you have to show for it? You know, there's that, that really famous uh, chronic fatigue guy that, that is on the groups a lot that doesn't do mold avoidance. And again, I don't really want to name him. I don't really need to be in a lawsuit. But, you know, there's people that are so stubborn that they, li they think their way of life is better by being sick somehow. It's like, how does that work? Yes, you know, Eric and I have had to make sacrifices and we've had to avoid mold and we've had to do you know, this stuff, but you only get one body. And if you can achieve a core level of recovery and a core level of health, then decide if you want to go back into mold and be exposed. At least it's your choice, your control, right? Like mold avoidance gives the control back to the sick person in that they can decide how healthy they want to be. Sure, they might need to make sacrifices. Sure, it might not be perfect, but they control the lever to pull right? Whereas every other sick person, they have no control. It's totally out of control. They're getting worse every year. And my argument is why I tell people that, I that I'm glad I did mold avoidance is because I'm at least in control of, of my life now. And it might not be the kind of control I wish I had, but I can at least decide, hey, I'm not feeling well. I got too much exposure. I can pull this lever and go get clear for a while and recover. And the longer I do mold avoidance, the less I even need to do that. You know, we moved out of a pristine area, you know, pristine's all relative. I don't want to get into that whole debate, but, and I actually kept a property there because I was like, I'm, I'm going to need to go back. I'm what if I need to go back? And I never needed to go back. I haven't been back there in two years. That's a miracle. Well, you talk about spending millions of dollars on various treatments. People have done that with the experimental immune modulating drug Amplogen, which is the premier experimental treatment for chronic fatigue syndrome. And as a member of the original chronic fatigue syndrome outbreak, I was offered Amplogen by Dr. Daniel Peterson. And he told me, this is probably the only thing that can restore you at this point. This is your only real hope. And I outlined the mold clues that were present in the origin of the syndrome and said, I want to try something else. And he goes, well, I don't think it'll work because you've already got the virus. It's too late. The damage has been done. You need this drug. I go, well, I can't afford it. This is all I've got left to try, so I'm going to go for it. So I conducted this protocol of extreme mold avoidance, all the decontamination, staying out of bad buildings, using my senses to even step away from people if I perceived that they had the badness on them. And within six months, I returned to his office with pictures of myself standing on top of Mount Whitney, the highest mountain in the contiguous connected United States. 14,500 feet with no altitude sickness, six months. And I was shocked at their lack of interest. Hmm. And I thought, this can't be right. I, I come back after telling you I'm going to undertake this experiment with pictures like this. And the reaction is, how nice for you? And that's when I thought, there's more to this than just the mold avoidance itself, more than the phenomenon. It's the sociological, sociological aspect of how researchers think. And something in their mindset has got to be severely broken if they don't find a clue in something like that. Yeah, it, I saw the same phenomenon when I used to go to all of the Lyme disease conferences. Um, there was some sort of mental illness among the doctors and the patients and the it, it was like they were so thrilled to present all this new information and the patients were so happy and excited but nobody ever really got anywhere 
next year at the next conference, it was all the same sick people and all the same doctors saying they came up with a new thing. And, but, but they were happy. I was like, why is everybody here happy? We haven't figured out a damn thing. Everybody's still sick. Who, why, what is there to be happy about here? But somebody, the, the patients were getting their egos fed somehow, and the doctors were getting their egos fed somehow. And so it was like this giant orgy of nonsense. Yeah, I call that beauty pageant science. <laughs> it's, it's like they all show up and strut around and they're fancy new abstracts, their new words, and they show off and they preen themselves and congratulate themselves on their fine work. And then they all leave and it's the same thing next year and nobody ever gets anywhere. I think that's, I, I think that might be why I am always less interested in the doctors and the science and the research because I'm disgusted from all of my years being in the, in the midst of that. I wasn't, I was an insider you know, I, I started a publishing company in 2003, back before, you know, anybody could publish a Kindle ebook. This was like a real publishing company where I had a printer in Michigan that printed 10,000 copies at a time. And I had a warehouse that stored my books and I had a forklift that moved books around. Like I was a real publisher and um, I got comped to the conferences. I got offered free passes. I got offered doctors who were giving $20,000 treatments, I got invited there to do it for free. And so I think I just have a really bad taste in my mouth from all the time I wasted and all the health I wasted. And I'm just frankly repulsed by that, by that experience. So that's a little insight into why I'm repulsed. <laughs> Absolutely. We need our scientists, if they see a good clue, they they need to fixate on it and work it for all they can, all they can get. So um, another quote uh, that you have said, um, let me just look, I've made a little list before we got on here so I could uh, ask you some questions, but um, well, actually this isn't a quote. This is just a, this is just a question. I'm sure some people are wondering, but what, what was it like for you when you were done with intensification and I know it's not black and white. I don't want to, you know, put words in your mouth that intensification is like a light switch that switches on or off. But like, how would you describe that, that um, experience of being on the other side of intensification? It was fascinating. It was like developing a superpower. It was like being able to sense the kryptonite that's trying to take you out and step away from it before it does its damage. And I had this amazing new ability and I wondered, can other people do this? Is it possible that if you get clear, get to the desert and go through this, this tunnel and come out the other side, will they come out with the same superpower? So that's why I had people reproduce the same experience, the tent in the desert. And sure enough, they had the identical experience. And from that point on, if they choose to exercise their superpower, they could recover in a similar way. Not everybody does. A lot of people, they want to go back to a normal life and they step back into society without going through all the measures that we have to take. They get careless and after a while the illness creeps up on them again. But it's good to know that if you want to do this, it looks like it's fairly predictable that you can go through the tunnel, acquire this hypersensitivity and use it to your advantage from then on. Yeah, sometimes I wonder why I had to get more clear than you. Um, I feel like a failure because I wasn't able to stay in Tahoe. <laughs> like after I did a couple of summers of mold avoidance, couple years of mold avoidance, I did go back to Tahoe and I tried and it was just way over my tolerance. I mean, there was no way. But then I realized too that it, it really does make logical sense that each future generation is getting more sick and it potentially has a worse time with it, you know, um, you know, you're a little bit older than me and maybe you discovered mold or you started mold avoidance earlier than me. Actually, yeah, you did. Mathematically, you had to because just doing the math. Um, and nowadays, it seems like, you know, mold avoiders are getting more benefit by going to, you know, more remote states, lower population areas. It, it just makes sense to me that, of course, that's it's, it's getting worse, not better. I mean, you know, people are sicker than they than they've ever been. Um, so maybe that's why I failed to re-enter Tahoe because <laughs> I, I at least say that to myself so I don't feel like a failure because I really wanted to, but um, I couldn't. 
Well, I am getting more reports all the time that the bad zones we identified 30 years ago, more and more and more people are reporting the same exact thing in these areas. Hmm. Yeah, my other problem is just being a, a father and a husband, like I couldn't, I had to go to a place where there wasn't as much badness because I had to participate in more buildings and civilizations. I mean, I, I remember in your writings, you know, you'd say, oh yeah, I got hit really bad in Truckee and I went to the desert for three months or whatever. I wanted to find a place where I could um, not have to be around quite as many bad toxins uh, so that my kids could do stuff. And it, the other problem with Tahoe was that um, we already had our established routines there. Like my kids had their friends' houses and their church and whatever, and some of them were in the really bad zones. So I couldn't go back and change their life around. I, I realized early on that I had to um, have a new life somewhere else where we could make patterns and um, establish routines that were better for mold avoidance. And then, you know, a lot of this with, if you do this with a family, a lot of it is like psychological planning of how am I going to get my wife and my kids back into, and it, I don't think it has to be a special location. I, I think it, we found many cities where we could do this. It, it wasn't like one place. There was dozens, but it, it, I thought it had to be a new city where if we went to the good buildings and the good locations, my kids would never say, Hey, why can't we go over there? Because they just would know nothing else. We were starting over, you know? Well, one of the really confusing things about this is the way this effect comes and goes. Some of the areas that got really bad for a while eventually went away and they're fine. This is why making a mold avoidance map or trying to make plans based on something you knew in the past may not apply to what's happening in the future. I believe that some kind of human pollution is coming in, feeding microbes an agent that makes them super powerful and if it runs out of that agent, or if it kills the mold, that effect stops. Hmm. So it's the kind of thing where you have to be highly adaptable and make, make provisions for either evacuation of an area when an event occurs. And if it goes the other way, if the badness dies away, be prepared to accept that you can trust your senses and now you can move freely through that area that once scared you so badly. So you have to be flexible. You have to be ad you have to adapt to the changing conditions. Yeah. Yeah, that's um that's interesting. Um that's harder to do with a family obviously. But yeah, it's it's uh I mean, you were really the right guy to figure all of this out because you had that flexibility, you know, you you could I don't know. I I just am amazed that you figured all this out. Yeah, uh, that's why I leave the practical mold avoidance up to you and try to get the researchers involved because trying to get an entire family uh, unit of people to do this, it's like hurting cats. I mean, it's all, but- it's um, Yeah, it's really an impossibility. It, I mean, I, I think about like, I hate to say it, but it is really hard. Um, I had every advantage in the world. I had a business that was location- independent that I could move around. I had some savings, which most sick people don't have. My wife and uh, was supportive somehow. My, my grandparents on both sides, you know, or my parents, my wife's parents were supportive. And I, I know you've said before that if you, if your parents didn't support you, that you think you'd be dead by now. Absolutely. Without my parents, I would not have made it. So even in the best of circumstances, mold avoidance is still extremely hard. Yeah, and I figured that I have a duty, a responsibility to use my privileged situation, the fact that I got so much support and the fact that I was in a position to see all the amazing things that I did, I, I feel like I've got a social responsibility to make researchers aware of this. Hmm. Yeah, it, it almost seems like we, we need to start like a, an Eric Johnson Foundation and take donations and build up your funds in some way to attract researchers. I mean, what do you even do? How do you get the attention of researchers? I don't know. I, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's what we're doing at Exposing Mold. Hmm. Alicia Swami and Keely Severson have put together a nonprofit and their goal is not to make us all rich, though that would be nice. I wouldn't turn that down. But our real purpose is to 
take researchers through this process. Let them see what the evidence is. Let them meet people who are going through this so they can learn about it and study this phenomenon. I've, I've always thought like a, a, it would be good to raise money to do like a documentary film on, on this. And um, I just think that would be a very compelling way to share the data. Uh, it, you know, that, that maybe, maybe one day I'll try to raise money for something like that. Films can be very dramatic and attract interest more so than like, I don't know. Well, it's kind of peculiar that Jennifer Brea did a fantastic documentary, Unrest, about MECFS. She didn't specifically go into mold, but she did put a segment in this documentary about mold avoidance because I trained her on this. And when she got back after her sabbatical in the desert in Moab, she got back to the East Coast and realized that she was in intensification. Couldn't we enter the very house that she had come from? So she and her husband put up a tent in the yard and she's admonishing her husband, Omar, don't touch my tent. Don't come near my tent. Don't even get near me because you have been in the house and you're contaminated. So she put this fantastic demonstration in a major documentary that's been seen all over the world. And there was not a single response. Hmm. That, 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 that part of her story was in the documentary, the tent and what you just said. Yep. yep. Interesting. I wonder, it, it does seem like perhaps mold avoidance is just so far off of what people are used to hearing about and comprehending that they just write it off. They don't have a framework. Again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about just the dogma of us being conditioned that medicine is a consumer and a vendor and a doctor and you buy supplements and treatments and you go to the office and that's just what people think medicine is. They, they can't imagine that you know, the whole intensification and hyperreactivity of mold, they just can't get that through their head unless they're personally forced to do it because they're about to die. <laughs> well, I put this story in uh, Dr. Schumacher's book, Mold Warriors, about my epiphany, really, where in the moldy bunker in Germany, I was called in for a disciplinary action by my commanding officer. And yeah, I was bad. I, I did it. I shouldn't have done it. So I'm there for my punishment. And he's screaming at me. And I'm going, yes, sir. No, sir. No excuse, sir. <laughs> Get ready for whatever um, he was going to do to me. And he got right in my face. And all of a sudden, he just collapsed, just hit the floor, turned red, and just curled up in a ball and hit the floor. And I'm, oh, my God, I got, I got my CO so mad at me that he's had a heart attack. And the sergeant turns and, what did you have for lunch, Johnson? What, what did I have for lunch? The captain's here dying, and you ask me what I had for lunch? Are you crazy? He goes, I had a sandwich. He goes, you idiot, what kind of a sandwich? I go, a peanut butter sandwich. There it was. He had a peanut allergy, and just a few molecules on my breath dropped him in his tracks. And here I was trying to wrangle with this mold situation. And the fact that I was reacting to contaminated possessions told me that this was more similar to a peanut reactivity than it was to an allergy. Mere molecules could be a driving force in my illness. And I realized that the doctor's view of measuring mold spores and getting a dose response by how many millions of spore forming units, that meant nothing to me my immune reaction was everything because this was like a peanut reactivity. Yeah, and, and that's what makes it even more frustrating that doctors and researchers aren't paying attention to this because we already have a framework or a precedent for this kind of thing. The peanut allergy, or you could say celiac disease. There's lots of these things where, or you, you could even say, you know, kids getting autism from lead-based paint in a house, even when the house has already been remediated and repainted and there's still, you know, but yet nobody will consider that maybe it's, maybe mold can do that to us too. It, nobody will even have an open mind to that possibility. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, so just, you know, I'm hoping that this video gets recorded on Facebook, who knows, and that we can share it. But, you know, just, just in case people aren't aware, um, Eric made a 
basically miraculous recovery from chronic fatigue syndrome by pursuing mold avoidance. And I made basically a miraculous recovery from Lyme disease by pursuing mold avoidance. So none of this is like theoretical. Um, this is very practical in the sense that uh, it really works to restore people's health. And on if you look at the mold groups, um, people who are following in Eric's footsteps, they're all getting better. And basically what happens is they trade in their problems. I like to say it's like a switching your set of problems. You go from having pr the problem of being sick to having the problem of dealing with contamination. You switch out your problems. You say, all right, if I avoid mold enough adequately, then I don't need to be sick anymore. Now my problem is how do I avoid mold adequately enough? And there's a really interesting dynamic that happens there because even though you're switching out your problem, number one, you're experiencing a miraculous recovery, which basically no one else in the world ever does. And number two, you're proving that mold is the problem because by avoiding it, you're now recovered. And those are such fascinating elements to a story that you really can't comprehend until you really ponder on it for a while that, wow, I'm able to you know, switch out my sickness for recovery by doing this thing. And um, Lyme disease and chronic fatigue and all this different stuff no longer matters to me if I'm just avoiding mold adequately enough. And, and that's just fascinating to me. You know, people are like, how are you not, you know, um, just sad about what you've given up? I'm like, I, am, I didn't give up anything. I had nothing when I was at my sickest. I did not have anything. I did not have my family and friends because I was too delirious and, and sick to enjoy them. Uh, I did not have anything in that condition. So now I might have a weird life, but at least I have a life. And, and, and I just, I, you know, I just keep going back to that as, as being amazing. And, um, you know, and I bring that up because some of the viewers, I'm hoping if this video uh, do, by the way, do I have your permission, Eric, to, um, do you mind if I publish this on YouTube and, and share it? Absolutely. Go for it. Okay. That's I'm hoping good. that, um, this video gets seen by a lot of people I, I have quite a platform, um, you know, from publishing Lyme disease books for so many years. People say, oh, Brian, you were a scammer. You know, you sold these. You, now you say mold avoidance is the right thing. But why, why did you make all these money selling books for all those years? That was the best we had. That was the best I knew how to do back then. I was just a desperate patient going to all these conferences, scribbling down the notes, putting it in books, um, you know, hoping just like everyone else that it was the answer. That was what we did back then. We went to conferences, we listened to the experts, we wrote it down, and then we published it. That was what you were supposed to do. That's what all everybody told me to do. And now that I have this following, I feel like it's my responsibility to share this information. Um, because when, when I was out there in the in doing mold avoidance and getting my health back, it was the first thing that ever really worked on a core level to get me... Uh, and that's why I tell people, you know, if you're going to debate mold avoidance, is it worth it? Should we do it? How do you do it? It's expensive. At least let's start at the very beginning, which is that it works. It might be hard, right? But it works. It's like going to the moon. If, you, if you're an astronaut and you, you know, you're able to go to the moon in a spaceship and it's hard and it's expensive and the spaceship might blow up, okay, that's fine. That's all true. But it's kind of amazing that you ended up at the moon. And that's how I feel about mold avoidance, that um, it, it's kind of amazing that I ended up recovered. And yeah, there's a lot of details to talk about, but let's just start with the with the fact of the case that I ended up recovered. And then then let's talk about the details later. But let's first talk about the fact that you can have a miraculous recovery from chronic illness. And then we'll talk about the details. But let's at least start at the, at that point that, that, wow, it actually happened. And, you know, I don't, how can I profit from mold avoidance? You know, people are, oh, you're making money from it. Oh, really? So by telling you to do a mold sabbatical and try, test out different locations, I'm making money. I, I'm, I get a commission from Walmart when you buy a tent. Really? It makes no sense. So. Well, the other thing is when you see a lot of people educate others about mold avoidance, they're talking about this in a purely chemical toxic overload type reaction. And as we can see from the peanut allergy model, that's not what this is. This is sort of an immune reprogramming. So the yeah. idea that you can just lower your load and get a little bit better, that may not apply. Hmm. So we really need to look at this in a new and different way. Yeah, 
that that uh, that um, saying that you know if you don't get clear enough, you might stay like this forever was exactly my experience. You know, I I did mold avoidance. I did it how I wanted to. I did get a little bit clear. I got a little bit better, but it wasn't until I really got adequately clear and took it to the next level that something switched. And then after that, I was able to experience that switch even in, even in worse locations eventually. But it took me getting to that binary point of being clear enough. Um, Anything else you want to add? I feel like I'm worried if this isn't, if I can't recover this recording, then I don't want to get too, too detailed here. I mean, I want to, uh, you know, make sure that this is, uh, that this is recording before we go for hours and hours. But, um, any, any, any other thoughts you want to tell people or, you know, what, what else is on your mind? Well, just to have some hope because when all else has failed, this is something that saved a lot of us. So there, as tough as it is, there is a way out. Yeah, and I, I can't emphasize to people how really um, amazing the recovery is. Um, I, I like to quote uh, this silly Disney song, this Moana song that says, the road isn't out there at all, it's inside you. And that's what people don't understand when they, when, I, when, when you're doing mold avoidance and you're out there in the desert or you're out there, whatever, the experience of regaining your vitality, your health, your mind, your 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 senses is so joyful that it outweighs anything else that you might be feeling any other depression or loss. Cause really fundamentally like happiness is a biological thing. Uh, you can give someone a medication that will cause them to be depressed, or you can give someone an antidepressant that will cause them to have, you know, feelings of happiness. The brain is biological and chemical. And so if you can get your health back and your brain back, it's really good. It's really a good thing. It really makes me happy to have my health back. And uh, I don't complain very much these days. I'm not a complainer. I, you know, my wife is like, it's been harder for her because she wasn't as sick. She didn't have, she gave up a lot, but um, I don't complain. I'm not, I don't complain about anything anymore because I never thought I would get, I would get a way out. Like Eric said, there is a way out. Um, I never thought that that would happen. So you guys, if you're new to this, um, Eric, can you tell people how you would like them to find your information or what project you're working on right now that's important that you want to share? You know, what, how can people support you or how can people find you? Or like, what, what do you want the audience to know in terms of a next step to connect with what you're working on? Exposing mold. Simple as that. And that's a, Exposing Mold is an organization that you're a part of, right? Yeah. And that's, is that exposingmold.com? Is that the website? Well, I think if you just look up Exposing Mold, that, that alone will be sufficient to take you to the information. So we're okay. very easy to find. All right. So I, I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at this now. I just want to make sure that this is the right website because I want to tell people um, Exposing Mold. Yeah, this is the right one. Okay, so if you guys want to go to exposingmold.org, it has all of the stuff that Eric is working on. You can do consultations, you can see resources, you can see their podcasts, events, Patreon to support Eric. So that's what Eric is up to right now is exposingmold.org. That's how you can find out his um, information. And then he also has his own Facebook group called the Eric Johnson Effect. Is that right? That's correct. So if you guys want to uh, participate in Eric's work, read comments directly from him, um, go to either one of those things, Exposing Mold and his Facebook group called The Eric Johnson Effect. Uh, I do the best I can to um, share Eric's work, but you should hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, and go learn directly from him. So uh, thanks again, Eric, and uh, hopefully we'll do this again. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. I mean, let's hope this records now. <laughs> okay.